This is episode 73 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear a special Thanksgiving story by the Houdini Brothers. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode number 73. And before I get too far, let me say a big thank you to everyone who reached out after listening to episode 72. The comments were overwhelming, and I'm very happy that the story was so well received. A couple of people mentioned that I should do more of those type of stories, and I actually have a couple more that I wrote, but they're not as long as the Devil and Harry Keller episode. However, I have a feeling that I'll be writing more down the road. Um, I'd also like to take a quick moment to push some other podcasts that I enjoy. First is my friend Billy Diamond, whose podcast is called Branding for Entertainers. I've appeared on the podcast three times now, and over the weekend, I started re-listening to the podcast from the beginning, and there are some real gems there. If you're looking for marketing advice, especially as an entertainer, please check out the Branding for Entertainers podcast. Next is Joshua J's new podcast, How Magicians Think, and I'll let Joshua tell you all about it. How Magicians Think is my love letter to magic and the best magicians in the world. It's a podcast about what happens when you spend every waking second of your life pushing the boundaries of what's possible. What is real is at the core of magic. Because when you see a magic trick, you often think, well, how could you have done that? My name is Joshua J, and I've been obsessed with magic since I was seven years old. It's all I've ever done. And now I'm here to share with you how magicians think. Next up is Discourse in Magic with Jonah Babbins. This is more of a business podcast centered on magic, but I just love it. Always, there are great pieces of advice on every episode. Jonah gets out a new episode probably every week. And if nothing else, you'll get exposed to a lot of magicians you may not have heard of. One of my favorite things is after hearing one of the episodes, I'll go back and I'll look up that particular magician that's featured and and quite often blown away by their magic. The podcast is called Discourse and Magic. I think you'll really enjoy it. And finally... Um, This one is probably the grandfather of all magic podcasts, and that's The Magic Word with Scott Wells. He has over 650 episodes, which, wow, that blows my mind. And he talks to today's magicians and often uh, does reviews of conventions and conferences. A very enjoyable podcast, The Magic Word with Scott Wells. And now for my Thanksgiving episode. In the beginning, there were two brothers named Houdini. One was named Eric, the other Jacob. Yes, Eric Weiss and Jacob Hyman. It was actually Jacob who came up with the name Houdini. Eric had been reading a book about the famed French magician Robert Houdin, and Jacob suggested if you add an I to the name, it would mean like Houdin. So they added an I and became Houdini, and they became the first Houdini brothers. Then Jacob left in May of 1891 to enlist in the army, and his brother Joe stepped in as the new Houdini brother. Eventually, Joe left, and Eric, or Harry as he was now called, chose his actual flesh-and-blood brother, Theo, to become the next Houdini brother. Harry and Theo went on to perform in dime museums and like venues. Eventually, they were booked to play the Midway at Chicago's World Fair in 1893, and for a brief time, Jacob returned, so there were three Houdini brothers at the World's Fair, Harry, who was just 19, Theo, only 17, and Jacob, who was 22. A year later, the Houdini brothers were playing in Coney Island. Theo had been flirting with a fellow entertainer whose name was Bess Rahner, and the next thing you know, 
Houdini steals her away, and within two weeks, they get married. Theo apparently had no hard feelings. Harry wanted to continue on with the act, but adding Bess. However, the pay was not enough for three people, so Theo bowed out. He went out on his own as Theo Houdini, and according to Theo in the Sphinx magazine, October 1939, Houdini asked him to change the name as, quote, as it would be confusing. He offered the name Hardeen as a good replacement. It made ideal business sense to not have another Houdini act out there, as bookers would likely get confused. But as it was, there was another Houdini act out there. Someone by the name of J.H. Houdini. Jacob Hyman appears to have gone out on his own as J.H. Houdini, probably as Harry was gaining fame. At one point, he even billed himself as the King of Handcuffs. It's hard to say if Houdini was even aware that his old friend was still using the name at first, but by 1903, Harry was more than aware. He had been trying to get Jacob to stop using the name Houdini, but to no avail. So... Harry sent another of his brothers, Leopold, along with their lawyer, and a pair of king breakers. King breakers are handcuffs that once they're placed on, they cannot be taken off. They can't be unlocked, basically. They're jammed in place. He sent the king breakers to one of Jacob's shows. Being the handcuff king, J.H. Houdini challenged people to bring their own cuffs, so Leopold went on stage and locked Jacob into the king breakers, and he was unable to open them. The embarrassing incident was followed with the threat of continued harassment unless he agreed to drop the name Houdini. Sometime later, Jacob Hyman dropped the name. He actually got out of show business altogether and went into medical school at Ohio State University. Whatever troubles were between Houdini and Jacob, they must have been forgotten over time. In fact, in 1906, Harry presented a new effect called the Prison Cell and Barrel Mystery, using the very same barrel that Jacob Hyman had used in his act. I'm guessing that Houdini may have purchased the J.H. Houdini show and props, to help Jacob pay for medical school. Again, that's only a guess on my part. But let's get back to the real brothers, Harry and Theo. In Theo's own words, because Houdini and I did the same type of act, there were innumerable stories of our rivalries and even some about our personal enmity. The fact of the matter was that he was my brother and we were always close and always friendly. He did a great deal for me, and I was at times able to do things for him, but due to our playing opposition houses with rival managers, we both had to do our best, and weird newspaper stories were published. And now pay close attention to this, again, in Theo's own words. At times, in my enthusiasm, I was a sore trial to Houdini. For instance, at the time of the vaudeville wars between Keats and Claw and Erlanger, Houdini was Keith's big star. Houdini got bookings for me on the Claw and Erlanger circuit and sent a cable to me in England where I was playing. Of course, this was quite unbeknownst to the Keith's offices. When my ship reached quarantine, a representative of the Keith's people boarded the ship and offered to pay me my salary not to work in opposition to Houdini and to return to England. And this is where, well, this is where I made my big mistake. Houdini told me we were to play the part of rivals, but I followed his instructions a little too well, for I told the press that not only was I going to play, but that I would pay Houdini's salary to be my assistant. The Claw and Erlanger press agents played the story up, and when I got home, mother almost had to pull Houdini off of me. It was a long while before it amused him. And now a bit more from Theo. Another time my enthusiasm got the better of me was when I was playing opposition to Houdini in Oakland, California, during Thanksgiving week of 1915. Houdini's big publicity stunt was the straitjacket escape, which suspended head down from in front of the newspaper building right in the business section of the city. The paper said 65,000 people watched the escape, and it did not seem to be an exaggeration for all traffic, including streetcars, were stopped. 
All the while Houdini was up in the air, dozens of boys passed out postcards. The postcards carried, well, carried my picture and the words, Pantages Tonight. Houdini was at the Orpheum. It took Houdini years to think that was amusing. Now, according to the Linking Ring magazine, May 1943 edition, again an article by Hardeen, he says this. Houdini and Bessie had invited Mr. and Mrs. Jack London, Mr. and Mrs. Alexander Pantages, and my wife and me for a big turkey dinner at the Oakland Hotel. The invitation to the Londons, by the way, is very curious for, for different reasons. Also interesting is that he invited Alexander Pantages, given the fact that Houdini was working the Orpheum. It was Theo who was working the Pantages. But regardless, Thanksgiving was going to be at Houdini's hotel, and before the dinner took place, the earlier events happened. Now, in this 1943 article, some facts change, but the overall story remains. In Theo's own words, Unknown to Houdini or anyone else, I had postcards printed bearing my picture and the words, All Week at Pantages. And these were passed around to the crowd. 20,000 people were watching Houdini and thought they were watching Hardeen up in the air struggling in the jacket. When Houdini found out what I had done, he was boiling. I never saw him so mad in all my life. But... He finally cooled off and even expressed his admiration for the stunt, but I knew he would try something to get even. Fast forward now to Thanksgiving and the turkey dinner. Theo writes, We all went to the turkey dinner, had a wonderful meal, complete with wine and cigars and all that goes with a perfect dinner. Then came the blow-off. Houdini handed the dinner check to me and then left the room laughing. Surely a great way of getting even. It's nice to know that even on the road, Houdini took time to celebrate Thanksgiving with friends and family. And before I wrap things up, I want to uh, do a little contest. Haven't done a contest in a long, long while. And it's a a quick Thanksgiving Magic Detective podcast contest. So here it is. Theo had another name. If you know the nickname, here's what you do. Send me an email at info at carnegiemagic.com. Again, that's info at carnegiemagic.com. In the subject heading, write Thanksgiving contest. And then just give me your... uh, your answer in the uh, <laughs> in the email, and I'll pick out um, one from a bunch because I know there are going to be a bunch of people that uh, will submit, and I'll just draw one out of a hat, and you'll be the lucky winner of an authentic Houdini bobblehead. That's right. If you don't already have one, <laughs> now's your chance to get one, an authentic Houdini bobblehead. And my friends, that's going to do it for this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. If you like the episode, please like it in whatever way your podcast provider allows. And if you're so inclined, consider giving the show a five-star rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. Uh, These things, they help the show in the rankings. and, And trust me, I greatly appreciate when you do them. My name is Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. I hope you have a joyous Thanksgiving with your family and friends. Until next time, be well and stay safe.